Um, now, what what is the, you know, there's a lot of views, you know, going back to Mill and, and other philosophers about why we should have freedom of speech. So what was what was the founder's purpose in the First Amendment and what is kind of a an objectivist approach to to what is the justification for First Amendment? The so I if particularly if you're bringing in Mill, the big distinction is is it an individual right or is it um, something granted to individuals because it's viewed as um, kind of serving, advancing some kind of social or public good? And Mill, we can talk about Mill in a minute, but he's more on the second axis. Whereas I think when, when you're getting the First Amendment, this is earlier than Mill's writing on liberty, uh, it's coming out of the Enlightenment. Mill is a post-Enlightenment figure. The Enlightenment is much more at an individual level. So that as an individual, you need the freedom to be able to survey, consider, evaluate, weigh um, every argument, every idea being advanced so that you can figure out, you as an individual can figure out, what do I actually think is true or not? And you can't allow any authority to give you pre-screened data to say, oh no, you don't need to see this, you don't need to look here and so on. That you're no longer, if you're on a quest for knowledge, if you allow someone to do that, that you literally, like you'll be put in jail if you want to read Galileo's text, um, that is you're surrendering the very quest for knowledge if you give grant government that kind of power. And the enlightenment, I mean, enlightenment means knowledge. What's, what's illuminating you is knowledge and it, you need a reasoning mind to reach it. And it's an individual yeah. mind that reaches knowledge. So it's, it's, I think of the first amendment as it's defending crucial aspects of intellectual freedom but it's the freedom for an individual to be able to think for himself, to talk to whoever he wants, debate, listen to, and whoever he wants, like it's, he's in charge, not a government or any other authority says, yeah, you listen to this, you don't need to listen to that. And so it's not, it's not skepticism. It's not, um, and there's an element of this in Mill's argument that it's like, who could know and who could, so you have to leave every viewpoint and so, there are viewpoints that I think are wrong, irrational. I would not give them even the benefit of the doubt. Take one of the things for hate speech of Holocaust denial. It's not like it's debatable. Did the Holocaust happen or not? So, but you can't, for someone who's investigating it, that's a conclusion. That's a conclusion of having looked at the arguments and, so, and, and looked at history and said, like, this is, is a complete conspiracy fantasy. It's ill motivated. So, but that's a conclusion that you have to reach. You can't let someone already decide for you, even when it's wrong. You have to be able to say, yeah, I mean, this is crazy. <clears throat> but if you can't investigate, you can't do that firsthand. Yeah, so, um, so what would, so Mill's argument is more about truth coming out in a social context and, and the benefit to society? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a mixture of, I mean, this is my view of it. It's a mixture of some good points about what the quest for knowledge looks like and what it means. It's not dogma, it's conclusions reached by a reasoning mind. So you have to go through the process mm -hmm. of reasoning and you need a freedom to do that. But it's mixed with the real social element that, um, yeah, this is how truth emerges in the end and this is good for society that it's happening and the whole on liberty and this is why Ayn Rand really disliked uh, Mills on liberty is there's a plea to allow the individual to function leave him free because he benefits other people yeah. not because he needs to be free so he can reach the truth for himself and his life and his values it's other people will benefit if you leave people free to think and particularly innovators and people dissenters who stand kind of outside of society and often challenging and so on. 
we're the better for it if we allow these people. So Socrates should be able to live or Galileo because he benefits other people. And it's no, so it's certainly not an individual right. And it's not an egoistic justification. It's not for your own pursuit of happiness, you need this, which is what it is in the Declaration of Independence. It's you no know, society needs some of these people. So we better, we're better off if we leave them free. So, so this strikes me as, you know, this is so closely related to the ethical views of Mill, certainly versus Ayn Rand, but even versus yeah. the, the, the views, the ethical views or the budding ethical views of the founders yeah. in terms of, of, in terms of where, where they, so how is this connected to Mill's views of, of ethics? Yeah, so I think it's, it's definitely connected that the whole utilitarian perspective is um, and the greatest happiness of the greatest number. If you're thinking of that from an individual perspective, it's the individual can pursue his goals, his values, his life, his happiness, only if it's really contributing to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So morally, the justification for you living, existing, so is the benefit to other people. It, it sort of includes you in the millions, but you're, you're lost in the millions if you, and if you read Mill's utilitarianism, which is actually very interesting to read, um, it's much more interesting than when you're taught utilitarianism in, in a philosophy class today. He's pretty explicit and pretty explicit means he's explicit about the connection to Christianity. Huh. And he's not challenging the kind of Christian viewpoint that it's service to your neighbors, that that's what makes you exalted. And so it's not about your life and, and your happiness. It's about um, other people. And if you have to sacrifice and give up enormous things for the sake of others, yeah, uh, I'm not, I'm, uh, as a utilitarian, I'm not challenging that that's what moral virtue and heroism or idealism looks like. Yep. And, and that's true. <laughs> it is akin to Christianity. And, and the founders, the whole idea of individual rights and the whole idea of viewing free speech is, is that kind of implicit egoism, even though they can't give it really voice? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's implicit. And you will find some explicit formulations that, I mean, so even something like the pursuit of happiness, it's the pursuit of your happiness. So there's formulations that are very egoistic in that sense, that they're self-interested. It's about you, your life, your values, your happiness. But if you're asking at the level of philosophical doctrine, can they advance a theory about this? The answer is no. And when they're operating at that level, and this includes, I mean, one of the drafters of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson, when he's operating at the level of what is morality, and it's, he's, now in, in sort of explicitly the philosophical realm, it's morality, it's not about reason, it's about you have a moral sense and you can, you sort of know, and it's, yeah, in science, we have all this kind of argument and so on, that's not what goes on in morality. And it's a much more conventional kind of watered down Christian view. And it's about um, your relationship to other people and, are you helping them? And so it's mu it becomes much more conventional when you get at the level of explicit philosophical theory and justification. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder. Please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now. Uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. 
But but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to hundred. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing. Whether you're looking at this, uh, and and you know the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at yourunbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.